Good morning, I'm Wayworn Worm, and welcome to my channel. And welcome back to the Monster Manual Backward. Today, we're going to be covering Frog and Toad and their giant versions. Starting with, well, starting with the frog, which is also the toad, we'll get into that. It's really clear that this stat block, like many of the others here in Appendix A, it exists as a starting point for the giant version, and it's not really meant to be used. But in case you ever decide to use a frog or a toad and need its stats, let's get into them. Frogs are tiny beasts and are unaligned. They have an AC of 11 with 1d4 minus 1 hit points, minimum of 1, of course. They have a speed of 20 feet with a swim speed of the same. Strength of 1, Dexterity 13, Constitution 8, Intelligence of 1, Wisdom of 8, and 3, Charisma. For skills, they get plus 1 to Perception and plus 3 to Stealth. They have Dark Vision out to 30 feet and a Passive Perception of 11. Frogs speak no languages and are Challenge Rating 0 for 0 experience points. They do have two special actions, Amphibious, which means they can breathe air and water. Not what Amphibious means, but whatever. There really isn't a better mechanical way to, to show the Amphibious nature of frogs. And toads, actually, I looked that up. Without massively overcomplicating things. They also have Standing Leap, which means that the frog's long jump is up to 10 feet, and its high jump is up to 5 feet, with or without a running start. The flavor text says a frog has no effective attacks, it feeds on small insects, and typically dwells near the water, in trees, or underground. The frog's statistics can also be used to represent a toad. Cool. Oddly, Appendix A is missing any sort of poisonous frog. Uh, if I were to make one, I would probably take the frog stat block and just add an attack where if they touch the frog, they have to make a constitution saving throw somewhere in the 10 to 15 range, probably a 12 or 13 to make somewhere between easy and moderate, and take half damage on a save, full damage on a fail, with the damage being... Probably 2d6. 2d6 would be on the lower side of dangerous for levels 1 through 4, and after that would be a pretty trivial setback. Um, I haven't gone through the equation that they have to figure out what challenge rating that would be, but I imagine it's probably in the range of like challenge rating half, maybe one quarter. Um, like a lot of the other creatures we've gone over here in Appendix A, I don't think I would ever use the stats for a frog or a toad, unless I had a druid wild shaping into one. Even then, though, I would probably choose a different creature, and I think my players would feel the same. They're just not really a reason to ever use these statistics and... Basically everything a frog can do, there's another creature that can do it better. So, yeah. Now, moving on to everyone's favorite, giants! This time we're talking about giant frogs and giant toads, which do have different stat blocks. Starting with the giant frog, we've got a creature that is worth using... Let's go over the stat block, and then I'll talk a bit about how I would use this creature. They're medium beasts and unaligned. Whenever I see something that is medium-sized, I always think about it being roughly human-sized. Although, for a giant frog, I'd probably think it's more like a dwarf, but even more. Even shorter and even wider than I tend to think of dwarves. With an AC of 11, they do have the same AC as their normal-sized cousins. They have 4D, 4d8 hit points and a movement of 30 feet, 
both as their normal speed and as a swim speed. They've got a much higher strength at 12, dexterity of 13, con of 11, intelligence of 2, which puts them at 1 point away of being sentient, uh, wisdom of 11, and finally 3 for their charisma, just like the little ones. They get a plus 2 to perception and a plus 3 to stealth, dark vision out to 30 feet, and a passive perception of 12. They speak no languages and have a challenge rating of one quarter. They have the two they have the same two special actions as their normal frog stats. Amphibious, which again is that they can breathe air and water. They also have standing leap, but since they are bigger, the distances are doubled. They can long jump twenty feet and high jump ten feet with or without a running start. Unlike frogs, they do have two actions. First, they have a bite attack, which is plus three to hit, a five foot reach on one target. Basically, it's a melee attack. On a hit, it does 1d6 plus one piercing, and the target is grappled, a DC of 11 to escape. Until this ends, the target is restrained, and the giant frog cannot bite another target. Its second action is the part that gives me ideas. It's Swallow. The frog makes a bite attack against a small or smaller target it is grappling. If the attack hits, the target is swallowed and the grapple ends. The swallowed target is blinded and restrained. It has total cover against the attacks and other effects outside the frog. It takes 2d4 acid damage at the start of each of the frog's turns. Now. I'll tell you why this excites me and gives me ideas. If we consult the Player's Handbook and Volo's Guide to Monsters, we find there are four ancestries that are spawned. We've got halflings, gnomes, goblins, and finally kobolds. One or more giant frogs would be a great encounter for a low level small for low level small characters. I could even see a low-level campaign of all small characters where they have to take back a marshland that has been taken over by giant frogs. If you're going to run the classic low-level foe of Bullywog, giant frogs should be involved. Now, there are a couple of cons that I have for giant frogs. One of them is Tomb of Annihilation uses giant frogs as a random encounter, or they're hopping through the jungle and eating everything in their path. Honestly, it's a really, yeah, encounter, and I would only use such an encounter once or twice. Either that or go far the other way and base most encounters around them. Uh, because without enough frequency to make it feel intentional, it just gets repetitive and boring really, really fast. And that's not good. There's also the fact that to be able to use Swallow, and the this is going to be against the giant toad as well, so I'm going to bring it up now, but not then later. Uh, you have to... The giant frog has to bite a a small or smaller creature um, the attack has to hit and then the creature has to ha basically you go through the rest of the turn order so all of the players including the one that is grappled and none of them do anything that breaks the grapple and then on the on the frog on the frog's next turn, you then get a another chance to do a bite attack. And if this second one hits, then you can swallow. That just the fact that it takes two turns, that's very unlikely to actually happen. But anyway, finally we get to the giant toad. It's a large beast and unaligned. Now, keep in mind when you 
when you are describing or picturing this, a horse is the go-to animal that 5th edition uses for what a large creature is. Like all of these creatures, they have an AC of 11 with 6 D10 plus 6 hit points. They have 20 feet of movement, but a swim speed of 40 feet. They have a strength of, of 12, dexterity of 13, constitution of 14, intelligence 2, 10 wisdom, and 3 charisma. It puts them at almost the exact same as the giant frog, just uh, slightly higher, no, same strength, slightly higher constitution. Um, they have no skills, dark vision out to 30 feet, and a passive perception of 10. They speak no languages and are challenge rating 1. They have the exact same actions as a giant frog, amphibious and standing leap, and they're exactly as I just described with the giant frog. It's got a bite attack and a swallow. The bite is plus 4 to hit. 5 foot reach, 1 target. On a hit, it does 1d10 plus 2 piercing, plus 1d10 poison, and the target is grappled, DC 13 to escape. The swallow is the same, except it's medium targets instead uh, and smaller instead of smaller, smaller, and it does 3d6 acid rather than the 2d4. Um, I would probably use a giant toad in the same way, that I use a giant frog. I'd use the toad instead of a frog for a slightly more difficult enemy, or if there's no small PCs. The swallow ability is a bit of what makes the creature as powerful as they are, which admittedly not very. So a giant frog doesn't really work against a party that doesn't have small PCs just because that gets rid of any chance of using Swallow. Um, you know, with the bite attack having a plus four to hit, that is going to be 5% more likely against anyone than the giant frog has. Um, the DC is too higher, which means it's 10% less likely that you're going to escape. So, it's better. It's not a great creature, but it's also not supposed to be. Um, there really isn't any amazing creatures here in Appendix A. But that is actually going to be everything for me. I hope you enjoyed this. It has been a year and a half since I put out a Monster Manual Backward video, but I am getting back into it. This Saturday is Halloween, and I've got a special episode of the Monster Manual Backward all ready for that. So, tune in then. Thank you so much.